Hello wonderful people, my name is Carol Vay and welcome back to my channel. One of the reasons that I don't speak a lot about current events happening in the news is because it takes me so long just to write out a video and record it and edit it and put it up. So my videos are produced in advance and so much can change in the news between when I start and finish. So I love to stick to the Bible and yet when it comes to Bible prophecy and these end times that we're in, it doesn't really matter what's going on in the news because the rapture of the church is imminent. There's nothing that needs to happen before the rapture of the church occurs. It can literally happen at any time. And yet when we do see so much going on in the news, so many people suffering here in the U.S. from the effects of Hur Hurricane Helene and everything that's going on in countries where there are wars and rumors of wars happening, it's easy to become discouraged and worry about what's going on. And many of you know that I just attended the Tipping Point Prophecy Conference in Dallas and it was such a powerful event, but I thought it was really interesting that three of the speakers brought up a passage in Psalm chapter two about the Lord laughing. And we do see the nations raging right now with more division in the US than I ever remember in my lifetime. We can see that our leaders are flat out lying to us, actually saying things that are dangerous. And this could cause many of us to wonder how long until the Lord comes to rescue us? Is he still in control? Does he still have a plan? And yet in this Psalm, we see the Lord laughing because he is still in control. He is still over everything that happens on the earth. In Psalm chapter two, we read, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. The Hebrew word for nation in this scripture is 1471. Goi, it's usually a Gentile, heathen nation and people. Here we see rulers and kings coming against the Lord. And we have seen anti-Semitism throughout the ages and persecution of the church. The world is always coming against God's people. These kings and rulers want to break away from God, like almost like let's get free of God cast loose from the Messiah. And doesn't it feel like it's getting worse by the day? In Isaiah, we read, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And yet reading on in Psalm two, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is a laughter, but it's a scornful mocking type of laughter. And these rulers and kings are distressed by the wrath of God, meaning they are disturbed, dismayed, terrified. And it almost seems like some of this could be going on right now. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Many of those watching for the Lord's soon return are seeing signs in the heavens. We just spoke about an annular solar eclipse and an asteroid that is being considered a second moon. And we've heard many on YouTube sharing about all of the dreams people have been having over the past few years about seeing two moons in the sky. We just saw the devastation of Hurricane Helene with waves roaring and men being distressed, their hearts failing them for fear, disturbed, dismayed, terrified. 
and continuing in Psalm 2, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. The Lord declares and decrees that Jesus is Lord. He will finally rule and reign with a rod of iron and we will rule and reign with him in his kingdom here on earth. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. So in these final verses of this psalm, we see the Lord who is rich in mercy, inviting those on earth to turn to the Lord. And I can almost feel this happening in these final moments that he does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We are blessed when we trust the Lord. No matter how difficult things get here on earth before the Lord's imminent rapture of the church, we will continue to trust him and not lose hope, not freak out. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. It's interesting in the book of Acts uh, that Peter and John healed a lame man and they, they healed him. They were preaching the gospel and the Sadducees and the religious leaders had them arrested for this. The next day, Peter and John address the Sanhedrin and they are threatened by these leaders and forbidden to speak the name of Jesus. But finally, these religious leaders let the two men go and Peter prays for boldness and he quotes Psalm chapter two, about the nations raging. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and all the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and with the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. I actually found a commentary about the Psalm 2 passage that I really liked in BibleRef.com that said the opening lines of this Psalm form a rhetorical question. The point is not to seek an answer, but to make a point. There seems to be no good reason why anyone, even kings and rulers, would try to defy God. The motivation of rebelling against God is selfishness and pride. This also comes with anger and hatred. The fury of the earthly people is not intimidating to God. In fact, his response to those who attempt to defy him is laughter. The symbolism of God laughing implies his complete power and sovereignty. When the nation rages and God laughs in response, it suggests how outmatched sinful people are. Despite the angst of those who disobey, God will establish his rule through Christ, just as he has promised. Right before Jesus was arrested, crucified, and killed, he knew his disciples would be living in a really difficult time. He had warned them about what was coming, but I don't know that they truly believed what would be happening. So they were probably a little bit upset and distressed during that last supper with Jesus the night before all this happened. So he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, 
there you may be also. Imagine those men laying around that table that night hearing this, and yet he is saying the same thing to us today. This promise has not changed. We can still fully trust that he is preparing a place for us, and soon, and very soon, he will be receiving us to himself. I think about how these disciples on the day of the resurrection and the rapture will be the dead in Christ who go up first. They're going to meet their souls in the air when they receive their glorified bodies. And then we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We're always talking about seeing each other, but imagine seeing these disciples that walked with the Lord and heard him speaking these words to them. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, including the disciples. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. All of those who have died from the day of Pentecost through when the rapture happens. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I'll tell you who hates the doctrine of the rapture is the enemy. And he has done such a great job of keeping churches from comforting one another with these words. We talked in Psalm 2 about the kings and the rulers of the earth coming against the Lord God Almighty, who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And one thing that I know has been distressing me a little bit is the recent remarks of Pope Francis. And in PillarCatholic.com, I read Pope Francis prompted controversy Friday, and this is following his September 13th remarks, with remarks at an inter-religious meeting in Singapore that some have taken as a departure from Catholic doctrine on the role of Jesus Christ in salvation. He said, all religions are a path to reach God. They are, I make a comparison, like different languages, different idioms to get there, but God is for everyone. Pope Francis told a gathering of young people September 13th at an interreligious meeting at the Catholic Junior College of Singapore. According to a text of the speech published by the Vatican, the Pope continued, and since God is God for everyone, we are all children of God, but my God is more important than yours. Is this true? There is only one God and our religions, our languages, paths to reach God. Some are Sikh, some are Muslim, some are Hindu, some are Christian, but they are different paths. I believe that this is complete heresy and blasphemy. If there were any other way of salvation, why would Jesus have needed to suffer and go to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. When he was suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night of his arrest, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And this cup did not pass from our Lord and Savior because there was no other way of salvation. And we just read about Jesus comforting his disciples in the upper room that same night when he said, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. He went on to say, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through Jesus Christ our Lord, through his blood atoning sacrifice for the remission of our sins. That is the only way of salvation. And that is why I believe kings and rulers have come against the Jewish people and the church 
all these years. Maybe they felt like it wasn't fair that it was limited to Jesus' act on the cross. And yet this invitation is open to all people. For God so loved the world, everybody in it, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we do have wars and rumors of wars and the waves and seas roaring and distress of nations, nations raging. So many coming against God in these last days, just like the Bible told us this would be. And now we have this leader, this leader of something that many might think is a Christian religion saying that all all pathways lead to God. So let's continue to pray for the lost. Let's continue to share the gospel. Let's continue to pray for those who are suffering now as a result of war or the effects of th these storms. And let us remember that God is in control. He is the creator of heaven and earth and the seas and everything in them. And he is coming back so soon to catch us up to be with him. We are seeing so much of what he told us would be happening in these last days coming to pass. And in Luke chapter 21, we read, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws nigh. So if you are a believer today, we are not freaking out. We are not losing hope. We have our blessed hope that we're watching for. So let's remember that God is in control. His word is set in stone. He will be coming for us soon and very soon. And if you do not know the Lord, now is the day of, of salvation. In the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, the five wise virgins had extra oil in their vessels. And I believe that is the presence of the Holy Spirit that was given to us when we believed. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is our guarantee until the day of redemption. But the five foolish virgins might be like Pope Francis thinking that all roads lead to God. They might believe that because they belong to that church or that denomination, that they are saved, or because they were baptized as a baby, they were saved. But when they came back, the door had been closed and they heard the Lord say, I do not know you. So we can know the Lord when we believe that he paid the ultimate price for the remission of our sins. He shed his innocent blood when he died on the cross because there was always a blood atoning sacrifice for the remission of sins. He died that day, was buried, and rose again three days later, just like the scripture said he would. And when we believe that he did this, we are saved. And I pray that you're believing this today. If you are turning to the Lord, believing that he did this for you, then praise God. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will all rejoice and be glad in it. And I will be praying for you and anyone who might be watching this video right now, that the Lord meets you right where you need him today with whatever it is you need. I know he knows what it is. And I pray that you can feel that tangible peace and comfort that the Lord provides. And I wanna thank you for joining me. I really do love and appreciate all of you so much. And God willing, I will see you in the next video or I will see you in the air. So take care and God bless you.